Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Min San here with our group of foreign journalists. It's great to see you all. Nice to be back. Thanks. Thanks. Right, it's December and many have their nominations for the Word of the Year and uh, this also includes fake news, a favourite of US President Donald Trump. What word would you pick for 2017, Frank? Well, I think Donald Trump might consider this a fake news uh, word. Uh, the, the word is dotard and uh, in response to being called some names by, by Donald Trump, including uh, Rocket Man and Little Rocket Man, uh, North Korea and leader uh, Kim Jong-un. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. And then I think through North Korean media uh, called Donald Trump a dotard. And I didn't know what that word meant actually and I had to look it up to find out that it meant uh, an older person, an elderly person that was kind of suffering uh, from a little bit of senility. So uh, it was interesting to see that and then that word actually became uh, really quite viral. It was an incredibly searched word immediately uh, when, it, when it came out. So I thought uh, that that was, that was an important word uh, of the year. Mm. What about you, Liz? I would um, highlight something that really happened towards the end of the year, but the uh, hashtag me too. I think um, the tsunami of uh, women who have come forward about their sexual uh, harassment um, experiences and sexual misconduct experiences at the hands of their bosses or people in power has been really a powerful thing that has happened in this final quarter of the year and will continue to have ramifications uh, across all industries and institutions and, and across different countries. And so I think that's a uh, a more hopeful way maybe to remember 2017 where we've saw where we've seen a lot of more negative consequences of uh, the Brexit decision last year and the uh, election of Donald Trump last year. Mm. Yeah, I agree with Elise. I think uh, Me Too is definitely one of the biggest keywords of the year. But if I have to pick up another one, that would be fake news. Maybe because I'm a journalist, but I think the assault against uh, truths and facts as a journalist is extremely worrying and we see that the president of the United States himself is trying so hard to uh, decriminalize and to attack journalists. This is something very worrying. All right. Well, the year 2017 has seen its fair share of events worldwide and interestingly enough, uh, quite a number of these key events start with the letter P, presidential elections, provocations by Pyongyang, and here in Korea, the Pohang earthquake. In our first report, we take a look at the presidential elections. On May 9th, early presidential elections took place in Korea. The presidential election was originally set to take place on December 20th, 2017. However, in the fall of 2016, things changed. After news of former President Park Geun-hye's confident Choi Soon-sil meddling in state affairs. And on March 10th, for the first time in history, the Constitutional Court upheld the decision to oust the President. South Korea has a new leader. South Korea's new president, Moon Jae-in. Moon Jae-in, the newly elected president of South Korea, is now settled in Cheongwa-de. With a voter turnout of 77.2%, the Democratic Party of Korea candidate Moon Jae-in received 44.1% of the votes and was elected into office as the 19th president of the Republic of Korea. <laughs> At the same time, throughout the year, a number of elections took place in different parts of the world, electing new leaders. In May, the French presidential election saw Emmanuel Macron become elected as the youngest president in history. In September, German Chancellor Angela Merkel was successful in getting elected for a fourth consecutive term. 
In October, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe secured another term with an overwhelming victory in the lower house election. Now, as I mentioned in the report, many countries, including South Korea, so their elections, presidential elections uh, this year. Uh, which uh, election were you most looking forward to? Fred, for you, it's probably the election in France. Was uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, victory an expected result for you? Uh, it depends on when you ask. If it was one year ago, I would say yes. It was completely unexpected. We, we had a kind of crazy year in terms of uh, uh, elections in France because uh, Elec Macron was really not a favorite. The favorite was François Fillon and there was this huge scandal that completely destroyed all this chance of winning the presidency but he refused to step down and the left in France is in disarray, it's divided. So Macron emerged as a winner but very few people would have bet on him just a year ago. It was very impressive. Right. Here in Korea 2017 was also eventful to say the least. We had the impeachment of former President Park Geun-hye and the inauguration of the current President Moon Jae-in. Frank, did you expect President Moon to win? Yes, absolutely. I, I expected him to win. I think uh, everyone expected to, him to win. Um, it was really interesting to see the, the whole drama unfold from uh, the fall of, of 2016 through, through to his, uh, his inauguration. Uh, and it's interesting to see him sort of maintain that popularity, you know, more than 70% approval ratings despite the challenges that he's facing um, with North Korea. It remains to be seen whether he'll be able to maintain that level of popularity um, through his term. But still, uh, I think it's astonishing the, the job that he's done um, so far. And you see the Conservative Party's really still struggling and still trying to sort of maintain uh, some degree of relevance uh, in the face of, of such a popular president. It is what do you believe paved the path to the impeachment of President, former President Park and the inauguration of President Moon? Do you suppose well, it was a public? Yeah, the simple answer is that the wrongdoing by the former administration and the president was so egregious that she had to go. Um, and so the public obviously watching the democracy movement, the candlelight uh, rallies was really impressive and something I hadn't seen before as a journalist. And that certainly helped um, in terms of getting popular attention, getting global attention to uh, dissatisfaction with the president. But the president should not be off the hook for what she uh, did as in office and obviously she herself is to blame for why she's not in power anymore. Hmm. Amid the launch of the Moon Jae-in administration, uh, many spoke favorably of the new government's efforts to uh, establish a channel, uh, a stronger channel of communication with the public. Uh, what would you pick as a notable change in this new administration as compared to the Park Geun-hye administration? There is two things. First is uh, in terms of uh, symbols and what it shows, image. There is a lot of efforts by Moon Jae-in to show that he's closer to people and that he listens to people. There was this image of him, you know, walking in the park with a cup of coffee in his hand and he was not wearing a jacket. And I think it tries, that to, it tries to show that he's open to other people's suggestions. And I think that's very important to try to break this very vertical hierarchy that we see in Korea. Uh, the second thing, there, there is this um, initiative that I find interesting. Now you can uh, put a petition on the White House website. You mean the website of Chang there? Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If you have an issue and you want the, the government to answer on that issue, if you, uh, if you have more than 240,000 signatures, then the government will have to take a stance and to answer your question. I find this kind of uh, initiative, I don't know if in the long run it will work, what kind of uh, change it will bring, but I, I like the fact that they are trying to be more open and... Mm. Yeah, we spoke about, well I spoke about this in the report, but Japan and uh, Germany also held their presidential elections with uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe winning yet another term, as well as German Chancellor Angela Merkel winning a fourth consecutive term. Uh, how do you explain this uh, win in Germany? Well, pretty much in Germany, I, th I think that, that she's struggling. We see her support base weakening a little bit there and that she's just kind of hanging on. I'd be surprised if, if uh, she goes on for, for another term. In Japan, uh, I think the, the re-election of, of Abe is something that 
was pretty much expected and maybe a little bit more worrying um, for South Korea here because he really consolidated, his party really consolidated its base and his drive to um, reform the pacifist constitution uh, maybe gain some ground there in Japan. Uh, in, in, if I can allow, in Germany the situation is a bit complicated because she's not directly elected. So now she needs to form a coalition and she cannot find it. She cannot uh, find an agreement with other parties to form a coalition. So she's in trouble. So her election is not uh, guaranteed yet. And she recently, really, she, she's been to a lot of trouble. It's not that easy for her. Now, apart from these elections, what else in the arena of politics and social issues comes to mind when you talk about events in the year 2017? Well, I look at North Korea and, and the you know uh, the whole sort of crisis and conflict that's taking place uh, on the Korean Peninsula, and uh, the UN Security Council responses to those, and the failure I think of the international community to respond um, to this issue. Uh, where we'll see this go in the next, I think, few weeks and, and few months is is will be very interesting in terms of international politics. Right, and on that note, we turn to our second report. We'll delve into the provocations by North Korea. For the first time since September, North Korea test-fired a ballistic missile the South Korean and U.S. militaries are saying was an ICBM. It was North Korea's 23rd missile launch of this year alone. On November 29th, North Korea conducted yet another missile test. This occurred 75 days after its last provocation on September 15th. President Moon Jae-in expressed his intent to push for strong sanctions and pressure on North Korea at the National Security Council. In 2017, North Korean provocations continued. North Korea, which fired a missile on May 14th, just four days after the start of the Moon Jae-in administration, continued its provocations thereafter. And on September 3rd, North Korea conducted its sixth nuclear test. Compared to its nuclear test in September of 2016, the sixth nuclear test was reported to be five to six times more powerful. Following this provocation, the international community agreed to sanction North Korea and send a strong message of warning. War does come. It will be because of continued acts of aggression like we witnessed yesterday. And if war comes, make no mistake, the North Korean regime will be utterly destroyed. North Korea's provocations have been relentless, and yet South Korea, as well as the international community, have been able to do very little uh, with regard to this appalling defiance. Why, Fred? I mean, first, if I can allow a very small difference, uh, as a journalist, I don't like the word provocations. Maybe it was true in the past, but the way I see North Korea now is that when they test nuclear device, when they test a new missile, it's not a provocation. They don't try to provoke something. They try to get as soon as possible uh, uh, like nuclear dissuasion capabilities. And really they just try, try to advance the nuclear and ballistic program as fast as they can. So I don't think they're trying to provoke the US they're just, or any or South Korea or any other country. I think what they're trying to do is ensure their survival because I think they feel more and more isolated and they feel that they might be attack, they, they, they really feel for their own uh, security. So I really think that the reason why we see this increase of pace of uh, nuclear tests, and really I, I, as a journalist I always avoid the, the word provocation, why we see this increase of nuclear tests is because they want, they feel unsafe and they want to ensure their security. What are the chances of a missile test or even a nuclear test during the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics next year, do you suppose, Elise? Uh, I don't know. I mean, the answer to the missile test question is probably you could see maybe a short, short range Musudan missile. It seems as though through North Korea's own regime's uh, state media that they are, they believe they have completed their state nuclear force when it comes to long range uh, ballistic missiles or intercontinental ballistic missiles. So uh, it's possible that we don't see something like that, especially right around the timing of the Olympics, just because uh, US policy is so unclear right now. So if I'm North Korea, um, I might be the more rational decision 
decision maker in this deterrence game right now. And the recent visit of a UN envoy to North Korea, uh, Jeffrey Feldman, I think is a positive development. Despite it's happening during uh, large-scale U.S. South Korea Air Force drills, that's still a, a positive development that we could look to as perhaps opening a door to some type of negotiations. Last month, China sent a delegation to North Korea in an attempt to ease the standoff between uh, North Korea and the international community, but little was achieved. What are your thoughts about ties between Beijing and Pyongyang at this point? Um, well, they were reportedly not great, uh, but China does com continue to implicitly allow for some border trade and some supplies to go to North Korea. And so the question now is whether additional enforcement of sanctions as the sanctions have ramped up will start to bite, especially as we head into winter months, because typically we see the effects of sanctions uh, more in the winter when, uh, when there's less farming and harvest. So uh, that's kind of an open question. But the Chinese relationship with North Korea is reportedly frosty, at least on the top level, um, between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un. I think to understand the Chinese position, I think we have to remember that China does not want instability at its border. And China somehow is more comfortable with a nuclear North Korea than with a collapse or a civil war unrest, civil war at its border. So I think whatever China will do, it will always try anywhere to prevent a collapse. I, I, that doesn't mean the like the fact that Kim Jong-un is getting nuclear weapons. But I, th I think China think they can live with a nuclear North Korea. So we should not expect too much in terms of, uh, as Elise said, I don't think they will try to really uh, choke North Korea so it collapse. Following a visit to North Korea by a Russian a parliamentary delegation this time, Moscow claimed that Pyongyang was willing to come to talks, was willing to meet Washington for talks as long as Russia took part as a third party. What are your thoughts on this, Frank? I think it's great that, that there are these proposals coming forward that bring the parties to negotiate. The problem is, is that, you know, the parties to the talks, the U.S. Or, or North Korea, they want to attach conditions to the talks. One of the conditions that the U.S. wants to attach to the talks is that North Korea is going to negotiate its way out of having nuclear weapons. And that's something that actually succeeded in previous negotiations. If you look at the agreed framework, it froze North Korea's nuclear and missile testing for about eight years. The six party talks similarly, uh, while they were being undertaken, froze North Korea's nuclear and missile testing for a number of years. When those talks were abandoned, uh, then we saw increased, increased testing. And really, I think the, the ship has sailed in terms of containing or preventing North Korea from becoming a nuclear weapon state. And to scale that back, to have them give up, is going to take a tremendous uh, diplomatic effort. Right. Now, in our third report, we take a look at the seismic shock in Pohang that has left many displaced and many buildings destroyed. On November 15th, Korea was in a state of shock and panic. That's because of a 5.4 magnitude earthquake which occurred in Pohang in the southeastern region of the peninsula. The strong earthquake occurred 14 months after the 2016 Gyeongju earthquake and the belief that Korea was an earthquake-free zone was shattered. The earthquake caused cracks in numerous buildings in Pohang and more than 1,000 people were displaced. Five days after the earthquake, the government declared Pohang as a special disaster zone for 20 days and worked on various follow-up measures. As the earthquake occurred one day before the college scholastic ability test, students in Pohang area were in a state of confusion. That was because a number of schools in Pohang, which were designated as test sites, were damaged and the safety of these students was in question. In the end, the Ministry of Education decided to postpone the college entrance exam. And a week later, even when aftershocks were detected, the students were able to take the test. While some expressed displeasure over the decision to delay the exam, the majority of the public reacted positively to the government's decision. The earthquake in Pohang struck a day before the state administered uh, scholastic ability test. And thus, uh, because of the damage to uh, test sites, 
the entrance examination itself was postponed by a week. What were your thoughts about the delay, Frank? Good idea. Had to be done. Um, you know, you can't, that, that test is, is really important to everyone in the country, including the people, uh, the young students in, in Pohang. And to have them go to a test site that just was uh, damaged in an earthquake is kind of ridiculous. To, to try to set up another site, it, there wasn't enough time. And to postpone the test for that specific area really isn't doable because of the secrecy surrounding the exam. So it had to be postponed. While it, you know, some might view it as unfair to those that had studied, it was uh, nonetheless a level playing field. It was the same situation uh, really for everyone. So postponing it uh, by a week was definitely the right call. And the Puang earthquake was also a reality check for Koreans because we realized for the first time that we are not earthquake safe anymore. What at least could the government do to ensure public safety in the event of another earthquake in the future? Well, um, as, as there is after any sort of safety um, incident, like following Sewol, uh, it's really important to re take a re-examination uh, re of regulations around building code and building structures and making sure those are up to standard and that building code is enforced by construction uh, workers and architects and companies that build. Because one thing that certainly uh, we know for sure is about South Korea is that it's so dynamic. And so you're watching restaurants go up and go down and building go up and go down so quickly and so um, if this is if there are earthquake prone earthquake prone areas now in this country I think building code is going to be something really important to re-examine um, you know emergency alert systems uh, those sorts of things uh, just to make sure that civil society is contacted in the event of emergencies I think that's always important and something that Japan has really gotten very good at with all of its earthquake experience over the years Compared to the previous administration, the Moon administration has been receiving quite uh, good marks for its response to emergency. This, this includes the, uh, the sending of the dispatching of chartered flights to Bali to help stranded Korean tourists there in the wake of a possible volcano eruption. We also had rescue efforts uh, when there was a collision between a fishing boat and a tanker. Uh, what are your thoughts about the current administration's response uh, efforts? I mean, it's, a, uh, it's difficult to, to say that it's because I think this is not one government, it's a long, long-term effort. And by the way, I read as well reports saying that uh, Coast Guard should have arrived a bit earlier on the scene of the accident. <laughs> so obviously there is still some problem, but I don't want to pinpoint the government. I mean, once again, it's really a long-run effort and I hope they will continue to, to improve the system. On a more personal level, what news coverage do you believe dominated the year 2017? I'll ask this question to all of you. We'll start with you, Frank. Uh, for me, uh, my coverage, it's, it's going to be North Korea. It's going to be the, the uh, provocations or so-called, I call them so-called provocations <laughs> uh, in, in my reporting uh, with North Korea and the, the military exercises that, that have taken place uh, with the U.S. And, and South Korea here in South Korea and the dynamic going on between uh, North Korea and the United States and, and North Korea's development of, of nuclear uh, and, and missile programs. Where that's going to go I think will continue to be a, a, a very interesting story next year as well. Elise, what comes to your mind when you think of the year 2017? Uh, well, we've looked a lot at the consequences of the election of President Trump in American media because that has uh, shifted the ground so much when it comes to uh, American foreign policy um, and throwing a lot of confusion into that, uh, relationships with other countries and diplomacy, but also just domestically a lot of things have been changing at a really fast pace in a way that, you know, it feels like there's 12 news cycles in the course of a day now, um, and even overnight, you know, we're obviously on the other side of the planet as the United States, and so even overnight, you know, so many things can happen by the time that we wake up here in Korea. So as an American journalist, it's been um, a relentless year. You know, I am in charge of covering Northeast Asia, this region, so obviously North Korea has dominated in a way that, you know, um, is to be expected. There have been the same, um, on pace, the same number of tests as there were last year, uh, except an extra nuclear test. Um, and that 
has been different because the administration has changed and the responses are different. And you see a lot more fire and fury rhetoric out of the President of the United States in the way that you didn't see out of President Obama. So that's what's really changed, I think. What about you, Fred? The same with me. I think my job next year will be to continue to cover the tensions between the US and North, North Korea. Uh, I hope that finally I will be able to cover talks. I hope <laughs> negotiation will start. I will be happy to talk about uh, something a bit uh, encouraging. And I hope things will, my, my best hope is to cover silly things. I want to talk about things that don't matter very much. I want to, I want tensions to go down and be able to cover other topics. And North Korean. <laughs> right, we, we all hope that, we all hope that. Now also starting with the letter P are the words peace, prosperity and passion, which also have, happens to be a slogan for the upcoming Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Now keeping this in mind, let's hope the next year, this time, 2018, uh, December, the panel of foreign correspondents and I are able to talk about the three positive words above. Thank you as always for watching.